Today I'm going to do a two-part series um, that is, if you're a great-grandfather, this is for you. If you're a grandfather, this is for you. If you're a father, this is for you. If you're a, a young man, this is for you. And if you're alive, this is for you. Uh, we live in a foolish world, and um, the, the more time goes by, our, our children are just surrounded by evil and influences that are bad. So uh, before I do get in, though, I just want to thank the team again for doing such a great job. And, um, you know, they, they you, you come out here on Sundays, but many of these people and those people back there are here during the weekend, Friday night, Saturday. It seems that we always have something on the weekend. It's not the men, the ladies, uh, seminars, whatever. And uh, some of them need a break, and I'm glad to see some of them taking a break. Our brother Roman has been on a little three-month break because, you know, he needs one. And then Manny's now on a break over here with his, well, on a break taking care of kids, you know, but, but that's a good break for Alexis. And um, uh, Sister Madi, the producer, and, you know, th there's, there's a lot of work that goes behind what these people do. They're here at 7 in the morning, 7.30. They don't leave till after the Spanish service. You guys are having lunch at uh, Arby's already at noon, right? And they're here again and again. So we just want to thank them. And if anybody says, you know what, I'd like to help on the team. I'd like to be a producer. I'd like to be trained. I'd like to be um, helpful. Uh, see Sister Christina. Sister Christina's over here. Raise your hand. In fact... Get up and sing a song so they can know where you are, Christina. Christina's the amazing leader of this, of this team, and uh, we need producers, we need helpers all the time because some of our team is just overworked and overwhelmed sometimes, and they, they do it with a smile, they do it while they're sick, they do it, you know. So thank you for saying, I'd like to work for a season, and we give these people a well-deserved break that they need. The only one that doesn't get a break is me. All right, and before I preach, uh, are the cameras ready? I know Hunt is watching. Rachel's taking care of him today because Tim, Sonia, and San Diego are preaching over there. And I just want to give, Hunt is isolated right now. Only a few people can go see him because of the situation. And he's just, he's just going crazy in the, in the house. So we just want to give him a, a shout out. So everybody, get the cameras. I don't pan them. Are you going to, yeah, there you go. Hi, Hunt. This is for you, Hunty. God bless you. God bless you. All right. I went to his house the other day, and some brother from the Spanish uh, congregation took him a game called Loteria. It's like a Mexican Uno. You have to play it with beans, okay, with beans. How many know Loteria? All right, yeah. El, so when the borracho comes out, Hunt goes, that drunk guy, you know. And so uh, he beat me twice in Loteria, and I beat him once. But I'm going to try harder next time. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you. We're doing good. We're moving forward. I want to speak to this generation today, but if you have great children, great-grandchildren or grandchildren or sons and daughters, Get this message. I was going to do this in one sermon today, but, but I want to take my time because I want to mm, arm you with word of God and principles from the word of God. So at some point in this message, at least once, I'm going to ask you to take your phone out and take a picture of, this, of two slides. And then next Sunday, I will uh, present the rest of that. I guarantee you, I, I've been anxious to preach this all week. Because I deal with my own grandchildren, I deal with um, your children, and there is so much influence. And instead of, and I might do a little bit next week, instead of identifying all the foolishness that comes from social media and the world of Hollywood movies, you know, I just want to stay with a genuine thing. They say that when they train tellers at a bank, that um, they never show them the false bills. Or the counterfeit money. You don't, you don't learn the counterfeit. They have them count, 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 count the real genuine bills. And that just gets in their head. As soon as they see something that's false or counterfeit, they identify it because they know the truth. We don't need to identify all the foolishness of the world. We just need to teach our children the truth. And I'd like to preach for, teach for a little bit on um, the foolish seat of the scornful, the foolish seat of the scornful. 
Psalm 1 gives us this phrase. It is the first psalm in the Bible. Psalms are expressions that were written, many of them by David, that talk about the heart of God and the heart of man. And this psalm is so rich. It is a teaching tool for us. Blessed is the man. Favored by God is the man, and of course the woman too, who walks not. These are ways you're not supposed to walk. Walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So um, your junior high school students, your high school students, even sixth graders today are being bombarded by ungodly counsel and peer pressure. They're, they're, they're saying, try this, look at this, uh, smoke this, inject this. And, and blessed is the man who walks not, who rejects the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. Well, if you send them to school every day, they are standing in multiple paths of sinners. And then it says, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I want you to notice a progression here. Blessed is the man who first you walk, you walk in the council, and then you begin to get that counsel and you stand in the way of sinners. And then what, what the enemy wants to do is for you and me and our children to sit in the Seat of the scornful. The scornful despise the things of God. Mock the things of God. The scornful, um, they think we're crazy. We're weird. Uh, how is it that 2% of the population, according to some articles I have read, uh, even have a slight inclination towards transgenderism? 2%. And what are our law do, uh, makers doing? They're making laws for the rest of the 98% where we have to go to the wrong bathrooms and all stuff like that. Is the world crazy? Yes. It mocks God's ways. Everything. Listen, don't expect the world to love you. They hated our master. They crucified our teacher. They despised our Lord. They mocked him. Why would we get any better treatment from the world? Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So the world is sitting at a foolish chair called the seat of the scornful, the despiser. And then he gives us some more counsel here. But the, the man who does not walk, nor stand, nor sits at the seat of the scornful, his delight, here's a contrast now, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. This is the rumination of the word of God. Like cows um, eat the grass and they digest the food through one stomach divided into four parts. They go, it goes down. It comes back up. They ruminate it. You see the cow sitting under a tree in a green meadow on a cool day and they're just... That's what they're doing. It came back up. They chew it again. It goes back down to the second stomach or the second part of the stomach. There's no four stomachs in a cow. I can prove it. I was a student of Dr. Saltman at U University of California in San Diego. Biology. I still remember. Four parts to one stomach. It goes up and down, up and down, and finally it digests it. And that's what that word meditate is here. You meditate on the word of the Lord day and night. You teach your children Teach them, talk to them the word of God while the mother's still pregnant. Just, just sit there and preach at them. Practice preaching, then you can come up here one day. Preach at them and say, read them the word of the Lord and teach them to meditate, okay? Set aside TikTok and all of their friends and get into the word. They're gonna be blessed if his delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates it day and night. What's gonna happen? He's going to be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall also not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Kids that are listening to me, 12, 13, 14, you want to get better grades? You don't? 
Get the word of God. Meditate in the word of God. Learn the word of God. When you go to bed, read a verse. Read one line, even one line. And when you do before you, the, the last thing you do before you fall into a deep sleep, you just get like those news crawlers at the banks or whatever go across your head. I got like room for four of them. Right? But you just, you know, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor, sitteth, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his light does he meditate. And you start falling asleep. What happens? When you, you, you memorize it, but now you're meditating it, and it goes down into your spirit. It's the word implanted. It's the engrafted word that James talks about. And then when that word is implanted in you, it's going to come out to your defense when you need it. So if you're having problems with lying, memorize verses that talk about lying. Why are wives elbowing husbands? <laughs> if, you're having, if you're having problems with cheating, memorize that. If you're having problems with lust, okay, all the men. If you're in problems with lust, just memorize things about not your eye not looking at a woman or things, things of that nature. You meditate on that. Okay. There's an interesting story in the book of Kings. Uh, we're going to read it. It's talking about Elijah. Elijah, he's been doing miracles. He's a prophet of God. Then he went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Twice. So he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Then he went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Can, can you, this is an interesting short little story, a couple verses. So here's a prophet. He's been multiplying and healing and doing a lot of things. And these guys, just, just, a, bunch of, just a bunch of brats, just mockers, scoffers, scorners. And they, they started calling him bald man. And twice, come up, you know. That was like a real insult, I guess. You would think he would just like, you know, let's pray for them. Lord, bless these kids. They don't know. He cursed them in the name of the Lord and the Lord allowed two bears to. So what's the lesson here? Don't mock bald men. <laughs> that, you know, and you got to be careful because Yogi will come after you. All right. <laughs> what is this? This is just an illustration of, of what can happen when we have a scornful spirit and the world has one against God. In the book of Peter, we have a little more. Second Peter 1, 19, 21 through 21. It says, and so we have the prophetic word. In that illustration, Elijah the prophet is a type of the prophetic word. He's the prophet that speaks the word of God. And many people today, we have this prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Spirit of God. What is he saying? That the Bible, the Word of God, is the Word of God. And that God enlightened the prophets to speak the word of God. And like these 42 kids that got killed because they mocked the prophet who brought the prophetic word. The same end will come to those who mock God's word. Holiness, kindness, respect, moral, living. All of those things are being mocked. In our junior highs, in our high schools, in our college campuses, all over the place. And we need to eradicate all scornfulness. We do not want to sit in the seat of the scornful with those. Second Peter 3, 1 and 4. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder... That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets... And of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. You have two witnesses here. You have the prophets of old and you have us, the apostle, Peter is saying. Knowing this first, 
that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So Peter's saying, you've, you've got to know that I wrote this to you with two witnesses, the, the prophets of old and us, the commandments of the apostles. But you've got to know this first, that there's going to be people who sit in the seat of the scornful. There's going to be scoffers who will come in the last days, we're living in the last days, and they're living according to their lusts. They're moved by their own sensuality. They, they don't care. They have no God or godliness in them. It, it, it is terrible to be led in this country by godless politicians. And I'm sure that the, that the forefathers of this country were imperfect, as many of the stories show, but at least they were fearing of God, Harvard University, Yale University, before every, anything else, they were school of ministries. That's what they were for ministers. And where, is, where are these institutions now? Way away from God. And what are they going to scoff? They're going to say, where? Where is the promise of his coming? You guys have been saying this. He, he's not coming. And it's the same thing that happened in the day of Noah. When God looked down and he said, I've got to destroy this earth because the, the sin of the people had come up to his nostrils and it made him sick. So Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and God told him, make an ark because I'm going to destroy this world. Interesting that it never rained back then. The earth was, was watered by, by gurgling wells that would come out of the water, uh, out of the earth. And so Noah far away from a lake and a, and a sea, started building an ark. It took him 120 years preaching and building the ark. And people would walk by and what would they do? They would scoff at him. What are you doing, Noah? I'm building a boat because it's going to rain. Rain, what's that? Water's going to come from heaven. You're nuts. And they would scoff. They would, they would mock him. And he kept building. He kept building. Man, you think you have a problem trying to get somebody to, to get a Bible study? They were mocking him until the ark was finished and he gets him there God told him put all the animals male and female I will ask God when I'm up there why he allowed the flies to come in we could have done without them especially when you're eating tacos in your backyard well it started to rain and the sea the, the boat began to float and they died everybody except eight people these Mockers like Noah are saying, where, where, where is he? He's not coming. You've been saying that a long time. And so they, they sit at the seat of the scornful and they mock. And then Jude says, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. So, what I would like to do today is arm great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, and kids with um, some Proverbs that come out of the Bible. That's where you get wisdom. It's one thing is to be smart, and one thing is to be wise. We need to be wise first and smart if we can. I'd rather have a dumb, wise person than a smart, unwise person. Because wisdom comes from God. Yeah. Earthly wisdom is natural and carnal and animal and perverse. But the wisdom that comes from God teaches us how to live. Now I'm going to touch some chords this morning. Because some of you may be living this or living with someone or you have a son or a grandson or a great-grandson who is demonstrating foolishness. And you don't know how to get to him. They don't listen to counsel. And I'm going to share something with you that I've, I've taught here at the school. And some of our students know it here. But I just repeat it over and over. And I'm going to share with you different types of foolishness that we find in the Bible. And uh, you can as soon as you can take a picture of the next slide and then the next slide as we go. I may have time to present two of them today and then we'll finish up next year and then finish up with an amazing story. Not next year, next week. OK. All right. So give me the first one here. 
I, I'm sharing with you five types of fools. The book of Proverbs was written by Solomon, who was the, wise, the wisest man who ever lived. And that's good, but it's, you know, it doesn't, look, Samson was the strongest man who ever lived. And it wasn't the muscles, it was the strength of God. God gave him strength to beat the Philistines. And he said, he gave him, he gave him a, a sign. He said, do not cut your hair. That was, of course, Old Testament. Don't cut your hair. That's where your strength relies not on your hair. It, relongs, it, it relies on your obedience to God. If God would have said, pull your ear all day, then that would have been it. But it was that. What was Samson's problem? He, one day he went out and fought Philistines, the enemies, and he killed a thousand and then another thousand and then another thousand. And you know what he said? He went home skipping, saying one bunch, another bunch, and another bunch. Another time he was fighting, killing Philistines, he got thirsty. He was fighting with a, with a jawbone of an ox, of a, of a donkey, of an animal. And with that was his weapon. And he's beating him up. And then he's like, oh, man, that was tiring. I'm thirsty. Evie on water comes out of the molar. And he was able to drink water from a dry um, jawbone. That's what God was doing. The strongest man, yet he had a weakness. It was women. He loved Philistine women. And you know the story about Delilah. You know, he'd lay on her lap there. And come on, Samson, the seduction of a woman. Come on, tell me your secret. He would lie. If you tie me with this, if you do that, if you... You know, feed me chilaquil. I don't know. That was it. That's not in the Bible. And then when the Philistines would come, she'd go, here he is. I got him. I got him. And then he would jump up and beat everybody up until the day he told his secret. So the strongest man in the Bible had a weakness with women. The wisest man in the Bible, which is Solomon, we're going to read his Proverbs. And at this time that he wrote these Proverbs, he was okay with God. When he, read, when he writes Ecclesiastics, the next book in the Bible, he's not okay with God. So what did he do? He fell in love with foreign queens or princesses. And he would bring them over. He would marry them. Solomon had 300 wives. And his concubines were without number. You know what that means? In Spanish, it says 50. It's not 50. It's without count. He had beautiful women all over. 300 wives. I could barely do it in one. <laughs> 300 wives and all these concubines. And the wisest man who ever lived fell because of women. David, who was the man who had a heart according to God, who wrote the Psalms, Psalm 1, blessed is a man. He fell with Bathsheba. So the strongest man, the wisest man, and the man whose heart was according to God's heart, all of them. So young kids, 13, 14, 15, 8, 9, hey, 4 and 5 these days, be careful with women, with bad women, with sensuous women, with seducting women, be careful. Their, their strength is, is big. Their, their ways are not of God. The Bible says don't even look in her eye. Don't because they, they capture your eye, their, their beauty, their body, their, their whatever. You've got to be careful to stand alone. Because if Samson went this way, if David went this way, and if Solomon went this way, we need God, right? Okay. And, and women, you too. So, in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, in English, it uses the word fool. But in Hebrew, it, it gives you a deeper definition according to the verse that you're reading. So, the first type of fool, fools are bad, or to be foolish is bad. I think we all struggle at one time or another with foolishness, Right? You have a 14-year-old every day, right? Or at least you fight with this. Well, uh, the, the first one, and this is like of the five, this is like the best one. If you're going to be a fool, be this one, okay? Or if you're going to have a fool, have this one. You don't, you don't want 
Uh, you don't want to go deeper than this, but this is him right here. He's called the simple fool. In Hebrew, that's the word pethi. And that word in Hebrew, simple, means to be extremely vulnerable. It's like a box to be opened. This young man or young lady or old man or old lady opens his mind to everything. Opens his arms to anyone. He has not developed discernment. And he is dangerously immature. He believes everything and is intensely curious. The simple fool. He's the one that, hey, drink this. He'll drink it. Look at this on my phone. He'll look at it. Hey, let's come this way and let's do this. He'll do it. He does not have discernment. He hasn't developed it. And right here, I must pause and not blame this fool for this. I blame the parents. Because the parents need to train up a child in the way he should go. If you're too busy to train up your child, I guarantee you, you will find the time to sit at a lawyer's office for three hours, to sit at a courtroom for four hours, to wait for a verdict for three days. You will be busy. You, your time, you either invest it now, helping him with Psalm 1, look, son, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. You don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You don't stand in the path of sinners. And you don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Your delight is in the law of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, grandparents and parents, sometimes our children and grandchildren are doing things right under our nose. And we're too busy to see it or too neglectful or too lazy to address it. I don't want problems. Go to your mom. Go to your mom. Go to your mom. Go to your dad. Just get in your room. You know, here, here's the iPad. Go, go, go to hell. Basically. So this man has, this young man has not developed discernment yet. Why? Because nobody has taught him. Fathers, can I beg you? Can I beg you, let's put down the remotes. Let's put down our own phones and let us spend time with our children. Remember the Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4. This is where you hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one God. And you shall love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And you shall teach this to your children when? When they go to bed. When? When you're walking on the way. When? When they get up. All the time. And so last Sunday we went to Phoenix to take care of uh, our grandchildren over there for a little bit. And I sat down with them and I taught them the Shema. And I, and I said, uh, okay, we're going to learn it here. And they, uh, they learned a little bit. And then uh, uh, we're going to have lunch. I go, let's do the Shema. We already did it. I know, but we're going to do it again today. And we're going to do it tonight. And then, Papa, can we go play football I am a football star. Can, can, you go, can we go play football? Yeah, yeah. On the way over there, you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind. Man, he keeps saying that. Yes, I'm going to keep saying it until I die. All right? That's why Jewish people, they, they were brought up with that. That was ingrained in their heart. That was implanted in their heart. And they loved the Lord their God. At least that was the idea to get that into their heart. So... This person, without instruction and constant discipline, the simple degenerates into deeper foolishness. It's not going to get better. You need, to, you need to find out who your, your, your children are hanging out with. What influences. My God, at this day we live, don't let your kids go sleep over their friend's house. We're just going to sleep over here. What's going on over there? You don't know how many cases of sexual molestation have happened because somebody's uncle was there, because somebody's cousin was there, because an older kid taught a younger kid, messed them up for life. 
Fast forward 25 years, they get married. They can't have a healthy sexual life. They can't enjoy the God-given pleasures that God made for humans in marriage. They can't because they're messed up. Where are the parents? Where are the parents? So I'm sounding the alarm because there is a, a chair called the chair of the scornful. And it's the devil and the enemy and the currents of this world that want to strip our children of anything that has to do with God. And you see the change in the little boy with the bright eyes and one of these little verses and just, just one summer vacation, one Christmas vacation, one bad relationship, one bad trip, one something they change. I've seen them here at the school. Here in our families, hey, how you doing? You know, praise the Lord, Pastor. How are you? What's up? <laughs> what happened to you? Who's feeding you? Who's who's not protecting you? And you've had babies. Take care of them. Take care of them. You're responsible, parents. We are responsible for this. So, what does the Bible says? Proverbs one one through four. It says. This is the introduction to, to a wise Solomon who was still right with God. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Why are you writing these? To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. To give prudence to who? To the simple and to the young man, knowledge and discretion. The reason I'm writing this book that contains 31 chapters full of wisdom. The Proverbs teach you finances. They teach you ethics. They teach you obedience. They teach you respect. And if you just, you don't have to be a scholar. Just read it to them before they go to bed. Just, just, we're going to read Proverbs 1. What's today? The 17th of March. St. Patrick's Dios lo reprenda day. All right? <laughs> today before parents, before you go to bed. All right? Come kids. We're going to read Proverbs 7. And just can you read? Can you read? I don't have kids. Read it to your wife. Because she may walk the way of. She may. Or read it to your husband. Read to each other. Just let the word of God go down in and look, look, at the, look at the reasoning. I want to, do you want your children to know wisdom and instruction? Of course we do. Do you want them to perceive, to understand the, the, the words of understanding? Do you want them to receive instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity? Do you want that simple? See, the Bible says that foolishness is bound in a child. Okay, some of you... Uh, Master degree psychologists are not going to like this, what the Bible says, but fight with God. Foolishness is bound in a child. He's already naturally going to be foolish. That's just the, the nature of sinful man. But the rod of correction will take it. I don't believe in spanking my kids. I'm not telling you what to believe. Okay. I'm here today because of the word of God. Right. <laughs> Uh, save your emails, okay? Don't send me articles of doctor away from God, you know. The, the word of God is true. And then another thing, it says, if you correct your child, he says, don't be afraid of his crying. He's not going to die. And then if you correct him with a rod, you are saving his soul from hell. Okay, so give me all your master degrees. Give me all your books written by ungodly philosophers, and I'll give you the Proverbs. Okay, now, I'm not talking about beating people over the head or kicking them and stuff like that. God gave each one of us a little place. Well, some of you gave a big place, but <laughs> did I say that? That was a Holy Ghost. God, God, God gave us a little place, okay? And then they say, you're never supposed to use your hand to hit. The hand is to 
The hand is to love. The hand is to, you know, but, but, and don't go out and get wires and cables with hooks on them and stuff like that. You know, many times just a, a word of God and, and, you know, sit down here will help. Him. I still remember when the, my father would correct me. I, how many of you remember that? Time? <laughs> I remember that. Eat your food. <laughs> I can't. You beat me to death. He said, no, no, no. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was amazing. Oh, man. My inbox is going to be so full of stuff like that. But uh, when you get my inbox full of it, I just text you back. You're full of it. <laughs> All right. Hey, I'm being kind of naughty today, huh? <laughs> I don't know. It's a, this, this really gets me going here because we're losing a generation. We're losing them to foolishness. And our own kids are going to end up sitting in the seat of the scornful. They're going to sit mocking God, want nothing with God. They laugh at apostolics who speak in tongues and believe in Jesus' name and believe in the Bible and holiness. And we're not perfect. No, no. I'm the most imperfect probably. But we're trying. We're trying to love God, to teach our children. Teach them. Speak it. Speak the truth in love. The Bible says speak the truth in love. I'm going to do one more, and uh, this now, the simple fool, he just does not know. He doesn't, he doesn't get it. He's simple. He hasn't been taught. And then the second one is called the silly fool. The other Hebrew word was pivil. This is evil. It's just the difference, and this is silly. And the definition here is someone who has missed the mark. Rejection of parental authority has caused him to violate his moral purity. And we're seeing this in seven and eight-year-olds who are already addicted to pornography. We're seeing this in 11 and 12-year-olds who have already had their first sexual experience. They know nothing about venereal disease. They know, they, they, they know nothing about the consequences uh, pregnancy, the, the, and then the violation of their own moral purity. When, when you sleep with a lot of people before you're married, when you get married, you bring them all into your bed. It's not just you and your husband. It's you and Pancho, Tito, Chango. I don't know who you slept with. And you're comparing, and it's unhealthy. God designed marriage to be healthy, pleasant, wonderful. Enjoy the wife of your youth, the Bible says. But when our kids in their teens are already sexually active, it did not start. I mean, the, the hormones are there. They're there. They're, they're, they're there. And, and like I've told you before, sometimes young men come to my office. You know, they, they go two by two because they're embarrassed to come by one. You know, so, yes, how can I help you? I can see it the minute they walk in. Tell them. No, you tell them. What? What do you guys, do? What do you guys want? Pastor, we have a problem. Yeah. Uh, we, <laughs> I don't know. We like, we like girls. Malls. Okay. No, but, but a lot. I mean, it's like, you know, out of the 24 hours a day, we're like 26 with girls. So I get up from my desk. I stand up. Come here, both of you. They're all like, okay, pray for us. Lord, I thank you that these guys are normal. I thank you. I thank you that they li like girls. Of course. But you don't act on it. You don't reject parental authority. When you reject your parents' authority, it's going to cause you to go the way of the foolish. Blessed is he that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, no stands in the way of sinners, no sits in the seat of the scornful. When you reject, and parents, we need to be careful that we present and exercise our authority in such a way that we fulfill the verse that Paul said, speaking the truth 
in love. Okay. Bring a piano player over here because I'm, I'm about done. Um, we speak the truth in love. Okay. When you have to speak to your children, do not make the mistakes that most of us parents make. It's screaming at them. You what? You perverted cochino. That, that is not a right way to present your parental authority. Because you, dad, know the word. You, mom, know the word. Because you, by this point, with the help of the Lord, you have already controlled your anger issues. But if you're 45 and you still have 13-year-old issues, you know, it's going to be hard to be a good parent. A good parent has to swallow their pride. You know, and here, sit down, son. I want to talk to you. That's on the outside. On the inside, I want to kill you right now, slowly. I don't want to shoot you. That's too easy. I want to choke you for three days. And hear you gurgling. Okay? You have to swallow and be caught. It's difficult. Did I make mistakes? Many of them. Many of them. That's why I'm sharing with you. You get the word of God. You sit them down. And you, you, you have to teach them. If you don't teach them, they're going to go by the way of the wicked and the currents of the world and their friends. The pressures they have. Now, we had pressures when we were in high school, right? All of you over 40, you remember high school, right? Well, imagine now the pressures, the darkness, the blackness is blacker. <laughs> the, the, the spirit of the Antichrist is just more present and prevalent. Our kids are fighting. They're trying out there. But the pressures are overwhelming. The peer pressure, the, the seduction of the man or the woman. The, you, you mean you're 14 and you haven't had sex yet? Come on. What's wrong with you? That's what they're getting. Okay, when we were out there, you're already 23, you know, but did I just say my secret? No. <laughs> it's bad out there, folks. You go to work, mom goes to work, leave kids alone with their devices, just getting all kinds of pornographic material content, either audibly or visibly, and just all, the, all those the games, the even even Disney's and you know all those stuff that just sublimity, just just even Frozen needs the Holy Ghost. Yeah, it, it, all of that, and and we're okay with it. We're okay. We buy them the stuff. We give them money to buy the stuff. And it wasn't a joke. Hear me, here, go to hell. This will help you. Okay. Would you let a man into your little girl's room? Uh, 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 an immoral, perverted man. Would you let him into your little girl's room? Of course we would. But you let him in anyway. When you go to bed, you leave him with Netflix there. Three in the morning, the blue light is still on. And they fell asleep with all that garbage in their mind and in their soul. And then we want him to come here and, and our Sunday school teachers to do miracles. Or the pastor to do miracles. Pray for my son. I will. But where were you the last five years? We need to snatch up our children. Yes, we're going to be old-fashioned. We're going to be nice. We're going to understand them. But we're going to say, let's walk this walk. I don't want my generation sitting on the seat of the scornful. So, next. Uh, oh, someone who's missed a mark. Rejection. Go back. How come you went over? Huh, huh, huh. Okay. It literally means thick-headed and stupid. Make sure Shiloh doesn't hear me because, you, Papa, you cussed. Next one, he reacts wrong to instruction. I want you to know the difference here. The silly does not know instruction. He doesn't know it. The, rather, the simple, the simple, the first one, he doesn't know. He just doesn't know. Nobody taught him. The silly reacts wrong to instruction. He believes his way is right. Arguing with him is a waste of time. He understands only with correction. Proverbs 29, 9. Take a picture of this. Read it at home. Study this. When things go wrong, his anger brings more damage 
and there's a corresponding Proverbs. His mouth gets him into problems. If he would close his mouth, he would improve others' opinion of him. You know what Proverbs 17, 28 says? Even a fool, when he closes his mouth, is counted as wise. Wow, this guy's wise. Where did you learn? <laughs> Even a fool, when he closes his mouth, is counted as wise. But what are, what are kids? No, mom. Yeah, no, no. No, you did it wrong. And you, no, no. And they start arguing back and forth. Is that, does that sound like your car? Or your dinner table? So whenever they're arguing like that, just, hey, mijo, even a fool, when he closes his mouth, is counted as wise. Wouldn't you like to be wise? Then shut up. Oh, something like that. Something like that. If you would, next, next one and the last one. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools, silly fools, despise wisdom and instruction. They despise it. Come next Sunday, it's going to get worse. I'm going to present three more for you. But I want you to study these two. Read the Proverbs to your children. And don't say, did you hear what pastor said? Do you read what the Word of God says? And show them they're starving. They're hungry. Many of them are angry at you. Why are you so angry? Te pareces a la abuela de tu papá and all this stuff, you know? No. They're angry because they know you should have taught them. And you didn't. Or I didn't. And I've had to recover a lot of things. And, you know, especially when my children were young. I had to go back and correct a lot of things. And I'll be sharing some of my mistakes with you next Sunday. It's going to be packed here. You love it when I share my mistakes. All three of them that I committed for the last 40 years. I'll share them with you. Our children are worth it. I'd like the parents, if you have your kids here with you, uh, or your juniors or whatever, come up to this altar. I want to say a prayer for you. Give me the first slide, the slide of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man. please. Come, come. Was this too hard for you? No? Oh, wait till we get to romances next Sunday. Oh. Take your sons or daughters by the hand. Put them in between you. Even if it's three or four. Come on up. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. If you want the best for your children and grandchildren... Now that you're here, Joel, come here. Come here. See this strapping young, handsome man? Young man. He's a baseball player. He's a pitcher. 92? 92 miles an hour. When you play for the Angels, you will tithe right here. But I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. We need to pray for Joel and all the Joels who are in Baltimore. Uh, baseball uh, sports teams we want to pray for those that are in the military you take a young man like this fool with the Holy Ghost just handsome and tall and you know and you don't think you don't think the groupies are after him you don't think them and their mothers oh yeah oh yeah and he lives in a dangerous world I'm, I'm, I greeted him this morning, and I had this in my heart, and I pray for him because he goes in there for the sport. He goes in there to play baseball. There's nothing wrong with that, but what's around that? I told my grandson, just said, I think he's a good football player, and he, you know, freshman on the varsity team, and I said, if that's going to send you to hell, I don't care if you're the star quarterback for whatever team you want to be. You serve God better. There's nothing better. And we want him to be him and all. He's just representing, okay? You're just representing. They're not as good looking as you, but you know, as us. As us. But, you know, pobrecitos. Right, pobrecitos. But, you know, he's out there. He wants to play ball. He wants to maybe, maybe. the devil is around, putting pressure all around him. And just all this. And, and, and if one 
dumb little girl gets him in her arms and he gets her pregnant, he's going to mess up on his career anyway. So it's better to serve the Lord, even if you could throw 120 miles an hour and all the teams want you and they offer you $4 million or $400 million. Am I prophesying? <laughs> it's better to serve God and eat beans and go to heaven than to sit in the seat of scornful. We have, we have some of our young men in the military. You don't think it's tough out there on the weekends when everybody else is going out to the, you know, and then they stay on the ship, they stay over there, and that's tough. That's tough. Am I, am I lying? Are, are, are they swirling around you? Uh, now you know, you know, but me and your mom and your dad, we're swatting them. Esta rubia, vamos para esta cochina, vamos para. We're just going to take them out because we want them to go to heaven, right? Yeah, let's, let's pray. Father, we love our kids. I ask you to bless our children against temptations. Give us, Lord, the wisdom to implant in them, to insert in them the fear of God because it is... The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. It is the beginning of wisdom, Lord. But fools despise wisdom. Help us to train our grandchildren. Just to read them these Proverbs. Our great-grandchildren, our children. Just You make a way that we can sit with them just for a little bit. And put the, put the seed in there, Lord. And then we'll pray and water it. Bless all of our young men, our young women, our parents, Lord, that we would raise up a generation that serves you and loves you. Keep us out of the seat of the scornful. Keep us out of the path of the wicked. Keep us out of the way of the ungodly counsel, Lord, and help us to raise a generation that will serve you, that will serve you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where's Elijah? Where's Elijah, the, the camera guy? Come on up here, Elijah. Where are you? Where? Just come, come on up here. Come on up here. You need help? Oh, you did. This was our number one preacher in, in the convention. But find, find his message where he confesses in his preaching what he was doing at 13 and 14 years old and how God was able to hear his parents' prayer, pull him out of there. And now he's going to nationals to represent us over there as the number one priest. That's what God does. That's what God does. And God can do it for your kids and your grandkids too. Let's all raise our hands and, and praise the Lord, everybody. Christ is my father.